I'm uh, Vali Nasser, the Dean of Johns Hopkins SAIS, and it is my honor to welcome you to the Foreign Policy Institute's second annual Betty Lou Hummel Memorial Lecture. The purpose of this lecture series is to present new perspective on international policy challenges from leading global thinkers. It honors the memory of Betty Lou Hummel, a member of the first graduating class of Johns Hopkins size in 1946. Intrepid and curious, Betty Lou put her size education into action through a lifetime of working around the globe. She taught at the Women's College in Istanbul, conducted research at the US Embassy in Tehran, and went on to live in Burma, Ethiopia, Pakistan, and China with her husband, Arthur, who was a diplomat at the State Department. Her life exemplifies one of the deepest and most valued components of the Johns Hopkins size education, which is seeking out knowledge and life experiences with societies and cultures different than our own. Doing so makes us all better leaders and citizens. Given the current transformation underway in the American political system, it is only fitting that we gather to reflect on Betty Lou's memory and to hear about why America matters from one of the country's most accomplished diplomats, Ambassador Nicholas Burns. It is with great joy and honor that I welcome back to SAIS Ambassador Burns, alumnus of this school. He is currently based at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard, where he serves as the Roy and Barbara Goodman Family Professor of the Practice of Diplomacy and International Relations. He's the founder and faculty chair of the school's Future of Diplomacy project and faculty chair of the project on Europe and the transatlantic relationship. He's also the director of the Aspen Strategy Group, senior counselor at the Cohen Group, and serves on the board of directors of Entergis Incorporated. Ambassador Burns, a career foreign service officer, has served the US government in multiple capacities as U.S. Ambassador to NATO and Greece, as Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, the State Department's third highest ranking position, as National Security Council Director for Soviet Affairs, and as Special Assistant to President Clinton and Senior Director for Russia, Ukraine, and Eurasia Affairs. Throughout his career, Ambassador Burns has led with vision and purpose, and his professional trajectory closely aligns with America's changing influence and role in the world. And we look forward to learning from his experiences today. Please join me in welcoming back Ambassador Burns to SAIS. Vali, thank you so much um, for the very kind remarks and for this invitation to re return to the room in which I received my master's from SAIS. 400 years ago, <laughs> or so it might seem to some of the students here as they look at an old person like me. Uh, I really admire Vali. We've been friends for a long time. I admire what he did in government when he had that incredible stint in government in the Obama administration with our mutual friend, Ambassador Richard Holbrook. I admire what he's doing for our alma mater. He's got a new vision for Hopkins. I know there's going to be a material part of that on Pennsylvania Avenue, a concrete part of it. And in rejuvenating this school, we're proud of you as our dean. I want to thank uh, Professor Carla Freeman, who's here. We had a great session this afternoon over in the Rome Building about what SAIS is doing in the field of diplomacy. And uh, we can work together, I hope, on that. And I especially want to thank a gentleman in the second row, uh, Professor Eric Edelman, here at SAIS. Um, we go all the way back to the beginning of our diplomatic career when we were young guys. And it's hard to, I know, imagine that. But we were. And um, Eric uh, was one of our great, great diplomats, an expert on the Soviet Union when it was our mortal rival during the Cold War, a, a very courageous ambassador to Turkey, and I think prescient. He saw the problems coming uh, with President Erdogan when he was ambassador, if I can say that, Eric. Um, and then, of course, Eric was Under Secretary of Defense at a time when I was Under Secretary of State. 
in the George W. Bush administration, and we were on the same side of the barricades on a lot of issues. The only difference was when I flew around the world about two weeks a month, it was on the back row of United, Eric had his own plane. So um, that's the difference for the SAIS students. If you want to be a diplomat or a military person, they've got all the planes. Um, but he would even sometimes give me a ride in his airplane, which I very much appreciated. So um, I want to also say, Volley, it's an honor to give the Betty Lou uh, Hummel Memorial Lecture this year. I'm, a, like Eric, a career foreign service officer. And you never leave the service, uh, just as the military uh, ever, never leaves the military. And so we honor her uh, for her extraordinary life and devotion to the United States. She wasn't always compensated uh, as the wife of a great diplomat, Art Hummel. But she made her presence felt in all those countries around the world. And I know how loyal she was to SAIS. And she was in the first graduating class in 1946 when SAIS was on Florida Avenue. So in the 75th anniversary year, it makes sense that we would honor her, and I'm honored to give this lecture. Um, it's also a privilege to return here to this campus. I arrived 41 years ago. I arrived with one immediate ambition. I wanted to get smart enough to pass the Foreign Service exam that I had flunked as a Boston College senior. And Sipes made me smart enough to barely pass the exam when I graduated from here. I'm really grateful to Sipes. We had, um, back then, this was the middle of the Cold War, we had an extraordinary faculty. If you think of the legendary Robert O. Osgood, and I still remember the books he wrote, the leadership, taking a course with him. I still remember Robert Tucker and Professor James Rydell and Professor Fred Hol Holborn, who was a fellow fan of the Boston Red Sox and got me through my first semester here. We had a great faculty, just as Sice has a great faculty now. I wasn't always enamored by the fact that we had to get here at about five in the morning to take our early morning language classes, but I sure appreciated it when I got to French-speaking Mauritania the month after I graduated. The Sice regimen in languages paid off. And we were talking today about economics. I don't think I would have voluntarily taken the seven or eight economics courses that I eventually took, but there were a million times in my career when I thank Sice for that I at least had a modicum of economic literacy in leaving this institution. Uh, in our time here, the founding mothers and the founding fathers of SAIS were a presence. Uh, here in this building, I remember our first year class, Paul, Ambassador Paul Nitza, the founder of the school, hosted us at his very elegant home with its very elegant lawn, with its sweeping views, as I remember it, of the Potomac River for a picnic. We felt close to them. That generation that formed SAIS was fully invested in this school, and that's a great legacy that, um, that we can build on. I want to talk today about that legacy because the story of SAIS in its 75th year coincides almost seamlessly with the story of the United States as a great power in the world. I mean, think of the foresight of the men and women who founded this school. They understood a couple of simple truths as, as veterans of both the First and Second World Wars, if you think about their generation. They understood the simple truth that America could not retreat back into an isolationist crouch after the supreme effort we were making uh, in the Second World War in a two-front war. The isolationist crouch to which we submitted so unwisely after the First World War. They understood that America would have to lead in the world for the very first time in our history. We had never thought of ourselves as global leaders. Maybe Theodore Roosevelt did in his ambitions for us, but we had never been that world leader. And the Republicans and Democrats among them in 1944 and 45 and 6 and 7 and 8 knew that we had to stand up to the responsibilities of leadership. When Winston Churchill took that famous stage in Fulton, Missouri in March of 1946, and he said that from Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain had descended on Europe, that founding Sice generation knew that we could only defend America then in 48 states if we firmly planted our flag overseas 
with a permanent American military presence in places like Western Europe and in Japan, and eventually just a few years later on the Korean Peninsula itself. And then with the creation of the United Nations, we began to weave that incredible tapestry, piece by piece, of the interconnecting regional and global institutions that became what we know as the liberal world order. Think of the liberal world order as a guardian of the rule of law, of human rights, of human freedom, and of democracy. That's what the liberal world, that's how it was conceived, and that's how it now needs to be defended when it's being challenged anew by the authoritarian states. One of my favorite disciples of the liberal world order is Professor John Eikenberry at Princeton. And if you read his 2011 book, Liberal Leviathan, about the United States in the world order, he, he says there's an international system and the United States is its system operator. The core ethos of that system is the word responsibility. That if you lead, you're responsible, of course, for your own national self-interest, but suddenly in a globalized age, after the founding of sites, we were more responsible for that global order than any other country in it. And so Americans embracing a concept of responsibility, of permanent, uh, permanent deployment overseas, permanent leadership, not as a matter of charity, but as a matter of self-interest, was a revolutionary concept. And that was the idea, Bali, if you go back and think about the founding of our school that they had. We all know the story. It's a familiar story. It's a very powerful story. I would suggest, I'm not an historian, that this is one of the great achievements in the history of the United States. The liberal order that we helped to create and defend for 70 years that has kept the great power of peace, that's held people, including ourselves, particularly now, to a higher set of standards of how we act in the world. And if you combine the idea with the extraordinary leadership, we're so lucky in our leaders. If you think of Truman followed by Eisenhower, JFK at the Berlin Wall followed by Reagan at the Berlin Wall, George H.W. Bush followed by Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, and Barack Obama as we expanded NATO uh, into Eastern Europe. All of this very powerful, theoretically, but put in place by leaders who really understood the price of isolation and the price of weakness. And think of the success from those seeds that they planted, and that the SAIS leaders, the founders, planted. If you think about the global economy, and the unrivaled prosperity of the last 75 years, they lifted a billion boats around the world. If you think about the historic breakthroughs in literacy and in life expectancy and in global health, you think about the amazing, extraordinary challenges of the world order when we were here at SAIS, decolonization, the end of empire, had just occurred in the 20 years prior to our arrival in my class followed by the fall of communism, followed by the fall of the Soviet Union, and mercifully with it, the cruel bargain that we had to make, that FDR felt he had to make at Yalta, and then, of course, the flowering of democracy in the 1980s and 1990s. In a way, this is what was spawned by the founders of SICE, that generation of Americans. And they saw it further the further fruit of it in the unification of Germany, and then ultimately economically, technologically, in the information age and the digital ages that have transformed everything about this school, about our life, and about our future. I feel compelled to say this. We were far from perfect, and it was far from a perfect age. We had Watergate, and we had Vietnam, closely followed in our years here by genocides in Cambodia, and Rwanda. We had the ill-advised and ill-fated stumbling of the United States into an invasion and eight-year occupation of Iraq. And just in the last five or six years, we've had the colossal human devastation of Myanmar and Darfur and Syria and now Venezuela. We are the descendants of that site's founding generation, but we are so far from wisdom and so far from perfection the irony is we're custodians of extraordinary power as Americans. 
as Westerners specifically, but we struggle with a confounding modern question. When do we intervene in someone else's civil war? And when do we make the decision not to intervene in someone else's civil war? As Eric and I sat across the deputies' table in a particularly difficult time, in the second term of President George W. Bush, that was always the central question for us. Should we be there? At what price? What, what level of commitment? Do we have a way to get out? How do we know that we're winning or losing? And it's extremely difficult to answer those questions when you stand for liberty and freedom, when you want to help, but you know you can't resolve everyone's problem. That's a confounding question that I think, I, I say to my students at the Harvard Kennedy School, one of the most vexing that we will continue to face and that they will continue to face. And we're wrestling as well with that dark isolationist gene in our national DNA. It's clearly visible today on the extreme left of the Democratic Party and on the extreme right of the Republican Party. And there's so many questions we need to answer that comes out of these questions. Are we truly committed to lead as the world's acknowledged economic, political, and military power? Or will those who say we should pull back and raise the drawbridges of fortress America prevail? Can we even summon the energy to lead after the failure in Iraq, the never-ending war in Afghanistan, and the legitimate need in 2016, I think, taught everybody on both sides of the political spectrum this, we've got problems at home that need a lot of attention and money by our national leadership. I think if the generation that founded SICE could return today magically to this stage um, to advise an America that shifted back and forth almost wildly on consequential issues in recent years, on climate change, on Iran, on the Syrian civil war, on the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Think of where we've gone on each of those issues, left to right, right to left, over just four years. They might not have all the answers for us, but they would be clear about one thing, and that's the title of this presentation. America really matters in the world. And it sounds almost like a hallmark phrase, but we're compelled in our national debate to repeat elementary truths. America matters. American leadership matters. American energy and optimism matters. And the world matters to us. We're not an island. It matters to our economic future, our political future, and our well-being. And in this respect, one of the great successes we've enjoyed has been a degree of bipartisanship that in some ways still exists. You can see it in the letter that the two senior Republicans on Senate Armed Services and Senate Foreign Re Relations and the two senior Democrats in those committees sent together this morning an op-ed in the New York Times to President Erdogan on the S-400 issue. Those of us in Munich this year, Vali and I were at the Munich Security Conference, we saw it in the 52 re Republicans and Democrats who in one voice from the Congress came to Munich to say, we do value NATO and we do value the European Union because they didn't want President Trump's voice to be the only voice. We have a bipartisan consensus still on issues like NATO and Russia. I hope we do an American defense. Eric and Admiral Ruffhead have just led a very important national commission that's gonna depend to make the changes we need on that bipartisan consensus. And this is one reason why President Trump's assault on this long and durable consensus is so damaging to our country. He's taken a sledgehammer to our carefully constructed edifice of American power and purpose in the world. He's seeking to smash nearly every building block and to turn his back on the core principles that made America great since the Seist generation founded us as a global power. He's making four major changes, at least four, that are particularly troubling to me. First, he does not believe that alliances are the great power differential between the United States and Russia and the United States and China. Just last week, as the rest of the transatlantic world was physically present here in this city 
to commemorate the 70th anniversary of the Washington Treaty, President Trump chose not to host a summit of his fellow NATO leaders as President Clinton did 50 years ago and as President Truman did 70 years ago when he assembled the North Atlantic Alliance in their first meeting. He did not even congratulate the Allies for the extraordinary achievements of the single greatest alliance in modern history. Think about that for a minute. Think about what a normal president of either party would have done last week. A normal president would have done what our mothers taught us. Thank you. Thank you, Canada and Europe, for our victory in the Cold War. Th thank you for responding to the alarm bell on 9-11. I was the American ambassador at NATO on 9-11. They came to our defense. And by the morning of September 12th, we'd invoked Article 5. And they said, we will go to war with you. And they did. And every single one of them went into Afghanistan. They took over 1,000 European dead in Afghanistan alone. And they were involved in the recent alliance against the Islamic State Caliphate in Syria and Iraq. President Trump did not utter a single word of thanks and gratitude on the 70th anniversary. Instead, and I watched his press conference, he did one thing. He complained about their defense spending levels. He has overturned, in this respect, beginning with President Franklin D. Roosevelt, seven, almost eight, decades of carefully constructed American support for a united Europe. In disavowing NATO, in branding the European Union as a foe and competitor, of the United States, he has stood American policy on its head. Second, he's attempting to dismantle the entire global trading system, the one that has lifted all those billions of boats. In just two years, and I just, maybe I lost track and couldn't count this high, he has sanctioned Mexico, Canada, the European Union, Japan, South Korea, and of course, China. Last week, he threatened to impose tariffs on Mexico if it did not end the transit of drugs, all of it, into the United States in one year. He is replacing the connectivity of the global age with crude walls reminiscent of the Middle Ages. Third, as anti-democratic populists rise in Europe, President Trump has effectively sided with them. He's sided with Viktor Orban over Angela Merkel with the authoritarian Polish government over Emmanuel Macron, with Salvini in Italy over Justin Trudeau. And this is the great existential challenge facing Europe, and we are now on the wrong side of it. And fourth, President Trump has also reversed the half-century consensus since the passage of the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965 that we can afford to bring into this country tens of thousands of legal immigrants and refugees per year. It's the right thing to do ethically in our immigrant nation. It's the smart thing to do, as SICE economic professors would have taught us 40 years ago, because immigrants make our society younger and more productive and more successful. At California's border with Mexico last Friday, the president declared we are full up we have no room for those wishing to fulfill the American dream as the ancestors of every American in this room did at some point in the near or distant past. The Trump revolt, and that's what it is in American foreign policy, is a rejection of everything that made us great since the founding of SICE. It is a rejection of the bipartisan ethos that made us effective. In a way, it's a rejection of the collective wisdom of every president from FDR to Barack Obama of both parties. His foreign policy is of impulse, ignorant tweets, grievance, fear, and resentment. And it's failing us. We're at a turning point as a result. The Trump uh, revolt is making us weaker not stronger. We have become less effective, less reliable, 
less purposeful in the eyes of our friends and allies. We are a less powerful friend to them. We are a less powerful foe to our adversary, Russia, and our competitor, China. And I do think, without American leadership, the world order as it was constructed by the founding generation is certainly going to weaken. It could even crack with unforeseeable consequences for global stability and global peace. Every student of whatever nationality understands the power of America. Why does America matter? We're the critical innovative hub of the global economy. The dollar is the reserve currency. We matter for international security, NATO and the transatlantic world. Our Indo-Pacific alliances, our emerging security partnership with India in the Indo-Pacific is critical there. This university, all of our universities, our foundations, our think tanks, our civic organizations, they have weaved a web of cooperation as bridges to the rest of the world. CIS is a perfect example that is really irreplaceable. That's what made us great over the last 75 years. All of those things. So for the SCI students here, you know, we're giving you a pretty difficult set of challenges to meet. On the danger side, climate change, trafficking of women and children, drug and crime cartels, a threat of pandemics, the whole range of cyber challenges in espionage, in business, in security, the race for space-based assets, you're going to be fighting a battle for technological supremacy that is being waged right now. I'm sure Eric's study looked at this in quantum computing, in artificial intelligence, in biotechnology, for the next generation of military supremacy. We've held the qualitative edge since 1945. I, as an American, don't want China to have it. We have to forge a relationship between the government and the military and our tech companies to win it. There's probably nothing more important than that, the battle of technology. Maybe the only thing as important is the battle of ideas, that the students here who live in democratic societies, who believe in democratic principles, have to fight with the authoritarian powers because they're brimming with self-confidence. Xi Jinping, Vladimir Putin, Mohammed bin Salman, President Erdogan of Turkey, they believe the authoritarian way is the way for all the world. We don't believe that. We believe in human freedom as Americans and the rule of law and of democracy. Think of a battle of technology and a battle of ideas contesting power among the greatest powers. Uh, you're going to have positive opportunities. You're going to live through probably the greatest alleviation of poverty in global history. It's underway thanks to China and India and Brazil and Sub-Saharan Africa. You'll probably see the eradication of certainly of polio and maybe even of malaria. And you're going to see the rise of women. So there are a lot of positive opportunities ahead. But you're going to have to be great and purposeful and take some leadership from that founding SIS generation to be armed for these battles and to be trained for them. Let me conclude about leadership. In the year before SICE was founded, Winston Churchill had this issue of generational leadership on his mind. He had met with FDR in Washington in early September 1943. He took the train up to Boston to be given an honorary degree in Sanders Theater at Harvard University. Um, it was a critical turning point in World War II. In the preceding 10 months, the Soviets had turned back the Sixth Army, the German Sixth Army of von Paulus at Stalingrad. The British Eighth Army of Montgomery had turned back Rommel, west of Alexandria and the Egyptian desert at El Alamein. The United States, the United Kingdom had successfully invaded Sicily. The Italian campaign was beginning on September 6, 1943. It was two days prior to the fall of the Mussolini government. And so it was clear the Allies were going to win the war at some point. It was also clear that the United States had passed Britain, the British Empire, sometime between Pearl Harbor, Eric might have a better sense of this than me, and September 6, 1943 as the preeminent global power. So in this sense, 
you might picture Churchill standing in Harvard Yard addressing several thousand young American cadets, young men and women who'd come for military training, they're in uniform, and Harvard undergraduates, at that time Radcliffe students, standing in tercentenary theater. It was really the passing of the baton from the power and leadership of the British Empire to the American people in September 1943. Churchill's central message to the students that day was summarized in one simple declarative sentence. Here's what he said. The price of greatness is responsibility. In, order, in other words, everything was riding on the ability of the American people and government to lead, and to lead with a certain degree of strength and wisdom about how one leads. The price of greatness is responsibility. He went on to warn the America of 1943 about the danger of isolationism in this same speech. He said, one cannot rise to be in many ways the leading global community in a civilized world without being involved in its problems, without being convulsed by its agonies, without being inspired by its causes. He was calling for enlightened, responsible, American leadership in the year before SICE was created for the same reason. And if that's not, Vali, a vital mission for your generation of SICE students now to be engaged and enlightened and responsible, that is the mission. And if our students can embrace that, then we can be that nation again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that uh, very both sobering and, and, and very thoughtful uh, comments. Uh, um, I want to use the prerogative of my, first of all, I would, I, I, tomorrow is actually our open house when we woo students to choose coming to SICE. I wish I had you <laughs> tomorrow. We have the same uh, thing up at the Kennedy School. <laughs> <by the way. laughs> um, but uh, I wanted to use the prerogative of my position to first ask you a question. I mean, uh, you uh, were ambassador to NATO, as you said, so, so you've seen the working of that alliance up close. You were also um, in, the, in the administration when we actually had a tough period with the Europeans around the, uh, uh, the, the Iraq war. Yeah. Um, and you've sort of seen this relationship at its best and, and also in periods of trouble. So, you know, one of the issues um, that, that perhaps is sort of lingering is uh, if, uh, you know, you have another term of the, of, of the Trump administration and the battering of NATO continues and if the, the U.S. aids and abets in sort of the populist uprising against the European Union, if you were to take us through this scenario, what, what might happen? In other words, what, uh, what is it likely that uh, would follow in Europe, and what would it mean uh, for, the, for the world order if, if Europe to unravel or if not NATO were to unravel? Yeah, thank you very much, and thank you for all being here, by the way. Um, maybe the one way to answer that is just to very briefly tell you about the, the morning of September 12th, 2001. Way to answer your question. Um, you know, we were cut off uh, from Washington. The Pentagon, State Department, and White House were all evacuated, and as you know, in the hours after 9-11. In the intervening time, we were six hours ahead in Brussels. Uh, the Canadian <laughs> ambassador came to me and said, have you thought about invoking Article 5? And he and I talked, David Wright, really great diplomat. We operate by consensus, so you can't do anything unless everybody agrees. I was fearful that afternoon that if one or two of the Allies said, no, we're not going with you, then the story the next day for the American people and our government would be, NATO box. And so we called around to capitals and to every ambassador, and by 9 p.m. that night, everybody was signed up. We called Condi Rice the next morning. It was 4 a.m. Washington time, 10 a.m. in Brussels. I said, Condi, we're just about to walk down. We're going to invoke Article 5, but it's essentially a declaration of war by the NATO alliance on what we presume was al-Qaeda. The president hadn't actually announced it was al-Qaeda. She said, go for it. I said, um, I need the president's personal permission. She said, go for it. 
I said, but I need the, she said, the president had a really bad day. And go for it. And here's the thing that I've always, so I said, okay, I'm going to take that. I'm going to take that as my presidential instruction. Eric understands this. We just, we're not free agents out there. Um, before we got off the phone, she said one more thing. She said, good to have friends in the world. And I, that's how I'd answer your question. Why would we want to be alone in the world? Confronting an assertive Russia, confronting this huge challenge of wanting to live peacefully with China, wanting to work with China, and yet not be dominated by China. We need allies. And I fear the, Valley, I think this. I think if President Trump's doing enormous damage, enormous damage to the alliance. When he leaves the presidency, I hope it's going to be January 20th, 2021. But maybe it's not. Maybe it's going to be four years later. I think the governments will have no choice but to come back and work with the United States. I worry about the people. When we were arriving in Munich in mid-February of this year, there was a public opinion poll that showed 8% of Germans had confidence in the United States. Eight. Eight. Not 18 or 80 of the United States, in the United States, more Germans had confidence than Putin, than Trump. Um, Mike, Eric, I don't think we've seen those kind of polls. When we had President Obama at 70, when you had President George H.W. Bush probably at 98 back in 19... Uh, 89, 90, and 91. And so I worry about that. Mm -hmm. You know, if the message to the Europeans is see, climate change may be your biggest issue, Europe, uh, 800 million Europeans, but we're just not going to help. We're leaving. And we know you wanted to, you like the Iran nuclear deal, we're leaving that too. And we know, we know that you're all invested in the European Union. Well, guess what? We're branding the EU as a competitor of the United States. I mean, think about the rhetoric and the actions. It's pretty powerful in your face move by the president against Europe. I'm really worried about it. Last point, three data points if you think Europe's not important. Largest trade partner of the United States is the EU, not China or Japan or India. Largest investor into our economy, the EU. Largest number of American treaty allies in the world, Europe. They really matter. And we are, um, we're at the lowest point, we're at the lowest point since before the Second World War since we created the alliance back in the Second World War to defeat the, the Nazis. Hey, let me open to the floor and uh, if you were to introduce yourself and uh, wait for the microphone, please. Over here. Hello, Ambassador Brent. Hello, Team uh, Nass. Um, my uh, question is a little bit disappointing and sad because it really breaks my heart to ask this question. But M President Trump is as bad as you say, and I totally agree, but don't you think he's the symptom of the problem and the problem is we the people? It, it, do you think possibly democracy could sow the seeds of its own destruction? Uh, we are more indebted as a percentage of our GDP than we were after World War II. But we fought a war. We sacrificed for that. But today, we're all just consuming. And I don't know how long we can do the debt leveraging and kind of borrowing from future to live today. There will be a day of reckoning for that. And how do you think that <coughs> may play out? It's a really good question. I think a lot of us get this question a lot. Um, uh, maybe I have a minority view. I don't think he's a symptom. I think he's the cause. In foreign and defense <laughs> policy, I'm not talking about all the issues that we have in this country about our domestic social policy, domestic policy. But if you're talking about foreign and defense policy, uh, the Chicago Council September 2018 poll says that 65% of Americans, that's a really high number, believe in NATO. Still believe in NATO 70 years later. If you look at the resolutions and bills passed by the Congress on Russia and on NATO, just the two issues which I'm close to, they have been resolutely anti-Trump. They've been, the Congress, led by the Republicans in the Senate and House, have been repudiating the president on those issues, not on health care, not on other issues, but on foreign and defense policy. So um, I see the Republicans and Democrats, the senior members, the experienced members, very much where they were under George Bush and Barack Obama. 
maybe not agreeing with the, on every issue with the administration, but resolutely pro-alliance, pro-U.S. defense, pro-State Department budget. This is the third time the Trump administration has come to the Congress now with a budget that would cut state between 30, 23 and 30 percent, and the Congress has thoroughly repudiated the Trump administration on the State Department. They've restored full funding. So at least in the area where I work and worked in my career, I think President Trump is the outlier. Maybe if we looked at the entire universe of, of issues that bedevil us, you can make the argument. He was elected. Um, but I think he's an outlier. And I would predict that whoever succeeds him after 2020 or 2024, Republican or Democrat, will not be an exact carbon copy of George W. Bush or Barack Obama, but they'll believe in these things that the SICE founders believed in, because it's the only way for us to think about our power in the world, in my judgment. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, my name is Asib. I'm a SICE student here, second year. Um, you spoke uh, briefly about the challenges to liberal democracy, and that, um, so, Look around the world right now, we see a lot of change with populism and the rise. You spoke about Hungary, uh, to, um, Poland, Turkey, we're also talking about, you know, America, Brexit. Uh, to what degree do you think populism poses a real danger to liberal democracy in the world that we are, we've built, that we've talked about 30, uh, 75 years? Now? Thank you very much. I think it's a cancer. The, the, the populism of Le Pen in France and Geert Wilders in the Netherlands, alternative for Deutschland, Viktor Orban, Salvini. It's a cancer on the alliance. Uh, ambassador Doug Lute and I were both former ambassadors to NATO, issued a report at the Munich conference on the future of NATO called NATO and Alliance in Crisis, NATO at 70, an alliance in crisis. And we had 10 recommendations for the alliance. And one of them is we have to confront that problem inside NATO because of our current 29 members Hungary, Poland, and the Turkish government are authoritarian in many ways, anti-democratic. And certainly, Hungary is a populist government. And we have these populist battles now. We're going to see it play out in the European parliamentary elections just this late spring. It's going to be, this is the big issue. The big issue is the rise of these anti-democratic populists. I'm not talking about conservatives or liberals, but people who don't believe in the second line of the NATO treaty, the second line talks about human rights and the rule of law and democracy. They don't believe in that. I'm very concerned that President Trump is on the wrong side of that issue. And you might see Steve Bannon as his forward deployed agent. He's been every, I've been I think eight European countries since last summer. Every place I go in Europe, Someone says to me, oh, Bannon was here last week. What's he doing? He's trying to unite these populist parties with one manifesto and one electoral platform for the European parliamentary elections that are just ahead of the Europeans. I worry about populism in the United States. One of the recommendations we have is that NATO, which has no provision to expel a member because we operate by consensus. So if you, go to, if you try to expel country X, Turkey, for instance, which would be a big thing. I'm not saying we should do that. Turkey would block it. Uh, so Doug and I, Doug Lutz, said, well, if you can't expel a member, we should shine a light every year. We should have some reputable think tank or university objectively grade all of us, including the United States, on how well we're adhering to the NATO values and shine a big light on it and maybe take away NATO infrastructure spending and NATO exercises from countries like Pol uh, Hungary, which would be the leading I think the leading edge of this populist movement. When Doug and I went around Europe trying to sell this idea, and even the government here, hardly anybody agreed with us because they all said, wait a minute, we're a military alliance. You don't want to anger the Turks. We need them. But we would say, but we're also a democratic political alliance. And here's the cancer from within, which gets to your question. Uh, we've got to fight these battles in each of our societies. It's not a conservative left-right thing. Far out people who want to undermine democracy from within. So uh, j let me just follow up on Turkey, just because it's sort of uh, when you mention it, 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 it brings a question to mind. So domestically, of course, Turkey is going in very interesting uh, directions, to say the least. But at least in, as, in terms of NATO, uh, 
you know, the, the Turks have been flirting with Russia quite uh, uh, seriously. This purchase of uh, missiles is, is obviously a very uh, brazen way of uh, trying to be part of NATO and yet be part of eventually a different kind of a military relationship with, with Russia. And then in Syria, they find themselves at loggerheads with the United States, uh, their NATO ally. You know, it's not easy, to, to, as you say, to, to eject Turkey from NATO. Uh, it's, it's not easy largely because it's probably the largest land army. Uh, within, Second largest after us. Uh, after the U.S. land army, or at least on the continent. Yeah. So, you know, on the other side of this, what is Turkey doing to NATO? And what can potentially Turkey do to NATO, irrespective of what's happening on the Atlantic side of this? Can I do this? Please. Answer your question, and then call on someone who's a million times smarter than I am. Absolutely. Who was ambassador we, we, to Turkey. We're all, we're all for it. There's a professor process. here. Yeah. My quick answer would be, I found myself at the National Press Club at 11 o'clock this morning in a public, <laughs> on, uh, on the record, debate with Professor Ibet, um, who was a member of the uh, uh, advisory council to President Erdogan. And we answered your question. And she answered it one way, and here's what I said that if Turkey does purchase and then deploy the S-400 um, missile system into the Turkish grid, uh, it will we'll have to wall off Turkey. And here, let me agree with the Trump administration, with President Trump and with General Scaparotti and with Mike Pompeo, Secretary Pompeo. What they've said is, President Erdogan, if you activate this air defense system, we, will, we cannot integrate it with a NATO air defense system because it's letting the Russian fox into the hen house. It would put us at a tremendous competitive disadvantage. It would downgrade our military capacity. And if you do that, this is how I read the administration, if you go ahead, we're going to take you out of the F-35 program. Turkey is slated to buy over 100 F-35s, and Turkey is a manufacturing point and supply point for the F-35 program worldwide. There's Turkish jobs on the line. And she argued point by point that it was our fault, Eric and me, and people like us, that we had driven the Turks away. And I argued the reverse. I think we're at a big moment with the Turks. We, will have to, we can't kick them out of NATO if all this happens. But we're going to have to isolate them within NATO because Putin is our strongest adversary. I think President Trump is exactly right on this, but Eric would know yeah, no more. Ambassador Edelman. Uh, right here. Yeah. Oh, well, I... That's yeah. on. Okay. Um, well, Nick, obviously I agree with you. I, look, I think uh, we have treated Turkey as if it were too big to fail for a very long time. And uh, we've been engaging in political moral hazard that has made the uh, relationship worse, not better. And if you look at uh, the interactions that Russia has had with, with Turkey, uh, that Germany has had with Turkey, uh, and even that we've had in uh, a couple of occasions in the past, uh, when we've treated things on a very um, strict transactional basis, we can actually get things done. And when we create facts, uh, President Erdogan responds to them. And the fact is that uh, Turks are fed up with his power. Uh, and if you look at the recent uh, municipal election results, which he is trying to overturn, yeah. uh, there is ample evidence of that. Uh, the AK Party has gone from controlling 75% of the economy of Turkey in the major urban areas to 30%. During the, uh, during the election campaign, uh, he said, uh, whoever controls Istanbul controls the country. And he lost Istanbul, which is why he is desperately trying to reverse that election result. So you and Doug Lute are exactly right. Uh, the um, issue of democracy in Turkey is ultimately a vital issue for uh, the alliance, in my view. Uh, and we have to be very, very tough-minded about it. The truth of the matter is there is a uh, credit, a debt credit bubble blowing in Turkey that is about to burst. Uh, now, some people who have uh, heard me uh, talk about this at SAIS over the last few years have heard me say this before, so 
I am eventually going to be right about the economic <laughs> crisis that's coming in Turkey. Unfortunately. And, and it's coming soon. And the problem is uh, for Erdogan that there's only one place uh, to be able to get the amount of money that's going to be needed, which is going to dwarf any previous IMF bailout. Uh, and that's going to require the support of the United States. We've got a lot of leverage. We need to be prepared to use it. Thank you. Um, so first, that lady over there. Uh, my name is Nazma Mithani. Um, my question is, the presidential uh, administration would succeed, which will succeed Trump, regardless of when, whether it's in the next election or the election after, what do you see as being their initial step and the challenge that we'll face in restoring and rejuvenating American foreign relations as well as America's position within international organizations such as the UN? Thank you very much. It's a big question. <laughs> we could probably form a whole size. Uh, Did you hear the? Could you repeat? Um, the presidential administration that will succeed President Trump, whenever that happens, 2024. 20, what do what do I think will be the major uh, ambitions and strategies of that administration? And I would just this is such a big subject. Uh, we could form a whole class of size on it. Maybe you should. Um, I just say a couple of simple things. We're in a deep hole. The next president, Secretary of State, Defense, National Security Advisor, Secretary of the Treasury. It's going to just have to dig us out of the hole. We're in a deep hole. Rebuild our alliances, particularly in the transatlantic world. I think they're less damaged in South Korea and Japan, but damaged. Rebuild the alliances. They're the power differential, number one. Number two, contain the Putin generation until it literally passes from the scene. The generation, American my generation of Soviet in born and trained leaders still in power in the Kremlin, hold the line in Eastern Europe by making sure that NATO is strong enough to prevent the Russians from trying to dominate Estonia, Latvia, Poland. Critical that, and we can do this. And then, as Americans, protect our electoral system from the hybrid warfare and cyber attacks of the Putin administration. I think the most complicated thing, I'll just say two more things, because we can go around the world and have 50 objectives. Two more. The most important, of course, is going to be China. And there's a big debate in our country between the engagers and the uh, more confrontationalist minded Americans. And I would just say, I was here at SICE, and I remember the state visit of Deng Xiaoping when I was a SICE student in 1979. I remember the, seeing the Chinese flags for the first time in Washington. You remember this. And I was excited. I think we all were that finally we we're going to have a diplomatic relationship with the People's Republic. From 1979, I think until about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, our strategy, every administration was, we're engaging China. We're also going to compete with China. I think somewhere, Eric, in the last year and a half, we've swung most people in the Democratic and Republican Party over to competition. So we have to answer a question. Is the answer to be an entirely competitive phase? Or is it to win the big battle to sustain American military strategic predominance in the Indo-Pacific, which I'm in favor of, and I would use those words, keep us the number one power, but engage with China on trade, on climate change, on all those other issues. I think we need a balance, but we're arguing that right now. The next president's going to have to decide that. Last point. Um, I interviewed Condi Rice. I, I greatly admire her. She's a friend. We both, Eric and I are both friends with her. About a year and a half ago, public forum, I asked her a question like yours. What do you worry about? What, are, what should our big strategic ambitions be? And without missing a beach, I thought she'd say Iran, North Korea, Putin, China. She said, we've lost our self-confidence. I said, what do you mean by that? She said, we've lost our self-confidence in the size generation values that we're the democratic leader, that democracy is a superior system, that we're not going to submit to authoritarianism, that we're going to stand up for our alliances, that we're going to be a strong leader. I admired that answer. I think she's right. So maybe it goes, it, it answers the first question, is Trump a symptom or a cause? We need a president of either party, doesn't matter to me, who can lead us forward on these consensual values that we believed in for 75 years, that we're the world leader, that we support democracy, and that we're going to be purposeful about it. And I think if we have a president like that, 
whoever it is, man, woman, either party, we'll, we'll, we'll climb out of the hole. We can, we're going to return. Joe Biden said, and I, I really think he's an impressive guy. At Munich, when we were there, he said, we'll be back. He didn't mean Joe Biden. He meant all the Republicans and Democrats, I think, who believed in the size generation values, we're going to be back. It actually needs a needs a forceful, uh, uh, you know, diplomatic team to do to do that and to restore uh, confidence to to allies. and the young people here. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Take part in that. Absolutely. Yes, this gentleman here, and then. Thank you very much. My name is Bohodir. I'm from Uzbekistan. With my colleagues here, uh, we are part participating in a wonderful program of Rumsfeld Foundation. Welcome. And we've been uh, meeting with a lot of people uh, of a very high profiles uh, like yourself. Uh, we just came out of the meeting with uh, Admiral uh, James Stavridis, by the way. A great man. Yes, yes absolutely. Uh, and over the last week, we've been very much exposed to um, an American foreign policy, an American perspective on uh, major things going on in the world. And uh, um, the, the views uh, of people we met and yours uh, in general concur. Um, but uh, this, is, this is the first time uh, during our visit uh, that I see someone referring to Russia openly as a foe. Uh, I mean, all of them, uh, of course, meant that, but openly, this is the first time. Which is well deserved and uh, quite fair, you know. Uh, <laughs> considering you live in the all neighborhood. the neighborhood, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> considering considering all the damage uh, they've caused to uh, the United States and a lot of uh, other countries and threat. But my question is, if we remove all the damage and threat coming out of Russia to the United States and leave only uh, stereotypical aspects of the uh, United States population and uh, leadership. Would Russia be still uh, be left with the status of foe? And uh, uh, do you see any opportunity in the nearest or uh, you know furthest future that uh, Russia could somehow be turned into an ally of the United States? Uh, Thank you. Okay, so you know I really like the words you're using because diplomats and professors are very specific about words. Russia's not an enemy. An enemy is someone we are about to fight, or are fighting, um, but Russia's an adversary. And I do agree, the Trump administration made some consequential formal statements with the national military strategy and the national security strategy report where they essentially said, rather than counterterrorism being the primary strategic preoccupation of the United States, it's now, that's still a very important objective to block terrorism, but Russia and China Competing with them as our adversaries adversaries, is now the most important strategic uh, goal of the United States. I think the Trump administration is right about that. And I think most people largely agree with that. But they're not enemies. I happen to think, because I'm biased against the Putin generation, because I worked with them, against them, have the scars in my back to prove it, um, I actually don't think we're going to see uh, any substantial improvement in our relationship with Russia until that Putin generation leaves power and life until they stop dominating the Kremlin. Um, and so that means we have to contain them in Eastern Europe. No more Yaltas. No more deciding the future of Ukraine or Georgia or, or Uzbekistan over the heads of the people of those countries. I think Secretary Rumsfeld would say you're a Rumsfeld scholar he would agree with that, I think, statement. Um, but, you know, it doesn't mean you end the relationship with Moscow. President Trump ought to be talking to President Putin. I, I would hope there'd be note takers in the room. I would hope the Secretary of State, the National Security Advisor, would be in the room. We should be talking about North Korea and Iran and counterterrorism and counter narcotics and telling them to get out of Venezuela, that kind of thing. So you want to keep the channel open. But we are competing with them. And maybe it's only the young Russians in, in the generation of the students here who will look at the map strategically 20 years from now when they're leading and say, our natural trading partner is Western and Eastern Europe. And we're going to be dominated by the 300 million Chinese who live just below the 6 million Russians east of the Urals. 
And once they start reflecting on the changing demographics and power differentials, I would think the younger generation of the millennial Russians are going to turn back to some kind of loose trading and non-competitive military relationship with uh, Europe. I can't see Russia being an ally of NATO uh, unless there's a seismic, some kind of sea change on the order of December 25th, 1991. The collapse of a system and the birth of something else. I don't see that on the horizon, although I would hope for it. That gentleman over there. Uh, yeah, yes, my name is John Mueller. Um, could you, uh, I agree with your critique of the Trump administration, but would you weigh his errors with those of the Bush and Obama administrations, which involved creating and then perpetuating a set of wars between Libya and Pakistan, which has resulted in the death of several hundred thousand people? When, when, uh, when Dean Nasser asked me to give his speech, uh, I wanted to get back to the home truths of the SAIS founding generation, as I understood them. People like Ambassador Paul Nitza, who we had to, I mean, when I entered the Foreign Service as the lowest ranking person in the government, he was an Olympian figure. Um, and I really believe in what they believed in. And I believed in the America, I still believe in the America they created, that founding generation. But I didn't want to stand up here and say it was all glory and honor and perfection because I wanted to answer your question and I thought I did in the middle of the speech. We made some major, and I participated in some of them. I supported the invasion of Iraq, for instance, in March 2003. I supported it willingly and openly and thought it was on, on the margin, on balance, the right thing for us to do and I, I deeply regret that decision. Now that I know how, it's easy to say it now, how the movie ended, if it's ended, it may be there may be several reels to go. So I think we have to be honest about where we've fallen down, why, and that's one of the things that SAIS, the Kennedy School, in this union between professors and students and fellows and researchers can do very well. You know, we have to think about where we go wrong, not just where we go right, and that's the value of SAIS and the value of Harvard Kennedy School. And I, you know, I think this, my, I'm teaching a course this semester on um, uh, war and peace negotiations. So we go from German unification to the South China Sea tomorrow. And Professor Friedman was very helpful to me in trying to figure out um, the role of ASEAN and China in that process. And you see where we succeed, and we have case studies of success, and we, I think we probably learn more from the case studies of failure. And then when you go at the end of the course, as we're going to do in the early part of May, and, and collect our takeaways from failure, they're surprising. They're, there's a common denominator there as to why you failed. You didn't integrate power and diplomacy effectively. You misunderstood your own power or staying power. You assume public or congressional support and it evaporates. You assume one outcome of an invasion and you forget that you have to occupy. And it takes you, you think you're going to get out in a couple of months and you stay eight years. You know, you go through it. We can learn some of the lessons so we can do better. I think that's the fundamental value of a university, a school like SAIS. Yeah. And then, you know, you can try to establish a positive vision. My wife always tells me, you know, she, she made the huge mistake of coming to one of my talks like this. And it was all about the challenges we face. And we were walking home. It's a true story. Eric knows Libby. And she, I said, well, how'd that go? And there was a pause. And she said, you're depressing everybody. <laughs> and she said, and this was a really important insight as a teacher, which I had kind of lost sight of. She said, I get all the problems. She said, but where are the analytical positive global trend lines? And why aren't you talking about those? Because you're teaching young people. And boy, that was a big insight for me because I think and I try to trace it back to my training as a foreign service officer. Much like the military, we were trained to defend and look out where are the things that can kill us and defend. And it was only episodically in our career, Vali knows this, work, that you could take the entire government and say, how can we advance? And so at the end of every semester, whatever course I'm teaching, I poll my students. I say, tell me analytically where the positive global trend lines are. Don't tell me what you wish for. But objectively, analytically, where are they? Every semester, here's in, in no particular order, the order scrambled is, 
greatest alleviation of poverty in history right now. Global public health, extraordinary inroads, rise of women, the power of technology are usually the top four. And so I say to the students, when you go out and work for any government, your job is to defend, but it's also to advance. And so the SICE generation has that really positive opportunity to make the world more just, more peaceful. And sometimes professors need to be reminded of that. They need their better halves to remind them of that. Yeah, well, you know, it's, uh, it's to, to the point that you say, you know, that there, there are sins of omission and there are sins of commission. And also, uh, there are, there are good, good deeds that are done by engagement and sometimes by not engaging. But I always felt, you know, since I was a graduate student and the way we teach students is that you always assume that there's a framework and you actually judge actions and policies based on certain ethical, you know, moral as well as political uh, you know, uh, benchmarks and frameworks, but, but it al almost seems that, you know, President Trump is pushing us into a world that has no boundaries, frameworks, it's almost law of the jungle. So, so I, I think the damage is much more than a single policy mistake here or a single policy mistake there. It's, uh, it's, it's a bit broader than that. Can I just say, I think you're exactly right. I mean, what's missing for me, I try to, I mean, I try to say some nice things about him in the Q&A because I'm opposed to him in almost every other sense. What's missing if you're a Trump supporter? Where's that positive American idealistic Reaganite, Ronald Reagan, a picture of the city on the hill? I mean, Reagan was a positive leader. He appealed to the better angels, Lincoln, of our nature. And Teddy Roosevelt was that leader. I'm just trying to think of, Eisenhower was that leader. I'm trying to think of Republican, George H.W. Bush. There's none of that in this vision. It's all sort of selfish, walls, mine, ours, keep the others out. You're a competitor, you're not a friend. I think Americans want something more. They want something we can get behind, whether we're conservatives or liberals. Exactly. First question here. Thank you. Um, I'm Mike Halsell. I'm a senior fellow here at the Foreign Policy Institute. Great talk. I'd like to ask a really quick, specific NATO question and then a broader one. The NATO question is, uh, in 19, from 67 until 73, I believe, uh, the Greek colonels regime yes. were isolated within NATO. They were kept, I believe, out of NAC, certainly out of the military committee. And for a a few brief weeks in the summer of 1975, the, uh, Portugal also was because yeah. it looked like it was going to go yeah. communist. Yeah. Would something like that four decades later be impossible? I mean, Greece and Portugal were and are small countries. Turkey, for example, is a big country. But I mean, is the, are, are these example, examples relevant at all? The bigger question I have has to do with how to translate your really brilliant analysis to the broader public. I mean, until now, unless I'm missing something, the Democratic candidates haven't said two words about foreign policy. That may change if Joe Biden gets in. I certainly yeah, hope so. I do too. But my guess is it's not because there's a lack of expertise as much as it is they're looking at the consumers and they, th you know, it's a push pull. I believe they think that most Americans just don't relate to this. How can we, how can we? tell them that the Trans-Pacific Partnership is important to them? How can we tell them that their lives are going to be influenced by, by NATO in a tangible way? Uh, you talked about the jobs and the investment, and, that, and, and certainly you could tell people at a car plant that a German automobile manufacturer has in South Carolina, that Alabama, South Carolina, in Alabama that their lives would be different if they would pull out. That's negative, but I mean, is there a way that we can get to the hardcore Trump support that just doesn't seem to care about these things? If he closes the southern border, it'll become an issue that all 28 Democrats uh, will, will raise. Um, I just want to say um, Mike is a great transatlanticist. And when we in the executive branch needed help, Mike and Congress gave it to us. And it was this symbiotic relationship for 75 years between the Congress and the staffs and, and, and various executive branches, and Mike's a good representative of that. Exactly right on question one. Doug and I went back and tried to play the film back. Greek colonels, 
uh, two Turkish military dictatorships and the brief Portuguese authoritarian regime of the left. Uh, and you can't expel them unless they agree to be expelled. We operate by consensus. So they're kind of side, as we went back and looked at the record, they're sidelined. They're not invited to the central table and the big issues. I think the EU, which does have Article 7, uh, but it's not, you can't expel, but you can shine a light in the EU on Orban. The EU is kind of pushing Orban away a little bit, finally. The People's Party, European People's Party, the collection of conservative parties, and it's long overdue. NATO, Doug and I, Lute, think NATO needs to adopt a provision at least to shine the light. Interesting, when we went around and talked to um, Europeans about that, almost all of them said, you better be careful. You guys are Americans. We're going to shine a light on you. <laughs> yes. And we said, shine a light on us. If we're imperfect, we should be self-confident enough to take the take the criticism. Um, and Mike, on your second one, I mean, I, I'm not an expert on American politics. I would think a successful Democratic con uh, candidate would be able to look, trade's a double-edged sword. It's such a divisive issue in our society. If you tell the truth about trade in goods and services, then that argues for, and I learned this at SICE, at, at SICE from Professor Rydell. I, mean, I became a disciple of the free market because of him here. And I still believe in what I learned here 40 years ago. Rising tide's going to lift a lot of boats. Look at the huge alleviation of poverty. And maybe the central story of the last 40 years since I was here is global prosperity built on the free market. Trump is tearing the edifice down. And there are people here who know a thousand times more than I do about that. I think that could be an issue. NATO, it turns out that NATO is a big issue in the public opinion polls. Americans really like NATO. And they really don't like Russia. And as Trump fails to criticize Russia and pals around with Putin, if I were advising a Democratic candidate, which I hope, which I plan to do, I mean, that's an issue where I think in certain times in the campaign, at a debate, for instance, weakest president we've ever had standing up to the Russians. I'd say that in advising a candidate. So we'll see. So, um, okay. Ambassador Burns, you, you, you're definitely a most eloquent uh, uh, representative of what this school stood for and what it educated its students in. And you know, thank you for thank you. what you represent of the school and your public service. And uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you.